Hello, this video is preparation for class number six. We're going to start working chapter, looking at chapter number three, which is all about experimental error and uncertainty in measurements. So in quantitative analysis, we do a lot of measuring of things. That's a lot of what the class is about. And so there's always the chance when you make a measurement that um, it will be wrong, or at least you'll be uncertain in exactly what value to report. So let's do a quick example. So let's assume that this is a centimeter ruler marked off in centimeters, so this would be one centimeter here. We've got this little gray box, and we want to measure how long it is. So why don't you take a moment and look at that and write down what you think the measurement is in your notebook. And then you can come back here and um, we'll talk about what I think it is. Okay, so hopefully you have a measurement now. So clearly it's between 1 and 1 1.5. And if we look at these tick marks, obviously they're marked off in 1.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And so it looks like this gray line is somewhere between 1.3 and 1.4. So we're certain of that. We're certain it's at least 1 centimeter long. And we're certain that it's at least 1.3 centimeters long. Now what do we do? Well, we're trained that when you have a linear scale like this, you estimate between the lines to the next digit. So it looks like it's a little bit more than halfway to my eye, so I'm going to call this 1.37. But I'm uncertain a little bit about that last digit. You know, it might be 6, it might be 8, not quite sure. In fact, you might have gotten a different answer. And if we asked everybody in the class to do this and report their answers, we would expect that there would be some variation there in that last digit that we're reporting. So that last digit, because we're estimating, is a little bit uncertain. So there's some uncertainty there. And so because of that little bit of uncertainty, that judgment call, it's possible that our measurement is actually different from what the true value is. So if the measurement is different from what the true value is, not that we can ever know maybe what the true value is, but if we could, and if our measurement is different from that, we call that an error, right? So you want to be the same as the true value. You want to faithfully reproduce that true value in your measurement. And if you're not doing that, it's called an error. So let's talk a little bit about how we deal with uncertainty and errors when we take measurements. So the first thing that we can talk about is when we report measurements, we want to consider significant figures because they're going to be related to that property of uncertainty. So uncertainty, there is a degree of uncertainty in every measured value. So some of those digits, we're not quite confident that we know 100% what they were. So here we're 100% certain that it's at least 1 centimeter. We're also 100% certain that it's at least 1.3 centimeters, between 1.3 and 1.4. But we're not sure exactly um, where it falls in between there. So there's some uncertainty there. So with significant figures then, um, so we can count significant figures and we report measured values to a certain number of significant figures. And what significant figures are, it's the number of digits needed to represent a value without losing precision. So the more significant digits you have in a measured value, we will say the higher the precision of the measurement. So precision, we'll talk about that in a little more detail in a minute, but you can think about it as the number of digits that get reported. So if you can report a measured value to a lot of digits, then you have really high precision in that measurement. So if we go back to this measurement, you will see that we estimate that uh, second decimal point, so 1.38 is what we estimated. And there's some uncertainty there, but we've reported that with three digits, so it has three significant figures. So if we were to call it three point, oh, sorry, 1.3827, then clearly that 27, there's no way I can estimate how close that is. So I will have lost precision. I will have um, misrepresented the actual precision in this measurement by eye. And so we don't want to do that. So we report just the significant, just the digits that are significant, that we are confident with, or maybe have a limited uncertainty. So our rule then is going to be that our first uncertain digit, so the first digit that you're not quite sure what its value is, is going to be our last significant figure. So when we're writing down digits, the first one where we start seeing some uncertainty, 
that's our last significant figure. Just a reminder that zeros that are to the left of numbers are just placeholders telling us how small a number is. So for example here all these zeros right here are just placeholders. So this number point zero zero three two one has three significant figures only. Um, we can see that too by moving this decimal place and rewriting this number in scientific notation. Okay so these digits right here are just placeholders because we have a very small number. So unless you're told we should assume that there's a minimum amount of measurement, a minimum amount of uncertainty that is plus or minus one in the last digit. So if I didn't report any uncertainty, then in this digit right here, we're going to assume the size, the magnitude of that uncertainty, that it's plus or minus one. So it's possible that this measurement is uh, 322. It's also possible that this measurement is 320. So our uncertainty, the amount by which we could be off, is plus or minus one. So sometimes this little plus or minus thing, which we use to kind of measure or represent the amount of uncertainty we have in the last digit, this is sometimes called an error bar. So it shows how big your errors could be in your measurement. So how far off could you be? Sometimes this is estimated and sometimes there are ways of uh, mathematically estimating what it is with more you know, degree of certainty there. Oftentimes we need to do calculations with measured values, right? And when we do that, we want to make sure that we're not changing the significance. So we're going to carry uncertainty in those numbers. And when we multiply and divide and add, subtract and do different kinds of operations, we want that same amount of uncertainty to be reflected in our result. So the way that we take care of that is by uh, following these significant figure rules. And so there are different rules depending on what kind of mathematical operation you're doing. So for addition and subtraction, and this one's the tricky one because we're used to doing multiplication and, and division, but so remember this one. The last significant figure is determined by the number with the fewest decimal places. So what we're going to do is keep the smallest number of decimal places. So here we've got a number that's 1.362 times 10 to the negative fourth, and we're going to add to that 23.11 times 10 to the negative fourth. So for counting decimal places, this first top number has three decimal places represented. This bottom number has two decimal places. So that's the fewest number, the smallest number of decimal places. So after we've done the addition, we're going to report our answer just to two decimal places. So two decimal places here, we're going to report our answer to two decimal places. So do note that if you're going to do addition and subtraction, you need to make sure that you're adding numbers that have the same power of 10 multiplier. So if the multipliers are not the same, you need to move the decimal place one direction or the other until they become the same, and then you can add them and apply this rule. All right. So addition and subtraction, it's the smallest number of decimal places. Keep that in mind. Then for multiplication and division, the number of significant figures is limited by the factor with the smallest number of significant digits. So we're just going to look at our numbers, we're going to count how many significant digits they have, and then we're going to report our final answer to the smallest number of significant figures for all the numbers that we're multiplying or dividing. So for example here, this first number has one, two, three, four significant digits. This last zero is significant because I've reported it. We would assume that we have an uncertainty of plus or minus one in this last digit unless we're told. This number right here that we're dividing into 34.60 is 2.46287. Um, note that the space here is just to help your eyes see when you've got groups of three, like we do with commas for really big numbers, but this is for uh, the decimal side of things. So this number has one, two, three, four, five, six significant figures, but we're going to keep the smallest number of significant figures, which is four, and so we report our answer to four significant figures, one, two, three, four. Good. So there's a quick review of significant figures. Um, so here's another kind of calculation that we'll be doing uh, later on in this class, and so you should know how to track significant figures in logarithms. There are a couple of other mathematical uh, properties that are described in Harris, uh, but we're not going to be using those much. So if you're taking the logarithm of a quantity, so either the base 10 log or the natural logarithm, so the way we do that is the number of digits that are in the mantissa, so the mantissa is the decimal part when you've taken a logarithm. So you're going to get an answer when you take a logarithm that has a number, and then it has a decimal place and some more numbers. And so the mantissa is the stuff after the decimal. All right, so the number of digits in that decimal part has to equal the number of significant figures in the quantity that we took the logarithm of. 
Okay, so as an example, when we take logarithms, um, pH, so if we are evaluating the pH, pH is related to the molarity of the H plus ion concentration. And we use this formula, that pH is equal to the negative of the base 10 logarithm of the H plus ion concentration. These square brackets, when you see those in chemistry, they mean molarity of whatever chemical formula is inside that. So we just plug in our molarity, 0 0.0255. We take the logarithm of that number, and then we make it negative. And so we're going to get this number. So looking at this number, how many significant figures we have? Well, leading zeros are not significant, so we have one, two, three. So we have three significant figures. So the mantissa, the decimal part, after we've taken the logarithm, should have three digits. So we're going to have three digits, one, two, three, in the decimal part, right? You may think, hey, but this has four significant figures. Yeah, that's okay, right? So this is a different rule. This is for taking the logarithm. So we want the number of significant figures and the number that we're taking the log of to be equal to the number of decimal places that we report our answer to. When we're doing uh, math like that, sometimes you'll have to round, all right? So always remember when you're doing a calculation, though, retain more b digits than are necessary in your calculation and round off at the end because you don't want to have what's called round off error as you're doing the calculation. Remember when you're rounding to look at all the digits beyond the last place desired, not just the first digit. And so what we're going to do is round up if this number is more than halfway to the next higher digit. So like here, 1.217948, all right, so 80604 is bigger than 5, so we are more than halfway, and so we're going to round that number up to this digit, so we're going to round that up to 5. We round down if the insignificant figure is less than halfway, so here we've got 121.794. We've put a little subscript here, this is an insignificant digit, and so if we're rounding to the last significant figure, this one right here, which is where our first uncertainty occurs, we're going to round that down. So down just means we don't change this number, and we're going to drop all of the uncertain digits. So we would get this, so rounding down. So what we're going to do if we've got exactly 5, so if we calculate a number and it ends in 5, or it's 5, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, nothing else after it, is that we're going to always round to the nearest even digit. Okay, that's so we will round up half the time and round down half the time on average because it's equally likely that we have an odd digit as an even digit. So if we have 43.55, and it's exactly 5 here, and we want to round to the tenths place, then this number, because it's odd, we're going to round to the nearest, e sorry, we're rounding to the nearest even digit. So the nearest even digit to, to 5, we're going to round up to 6, okay, because we're already halfway there. So 0.55, so we're going to round to the next even digit. So if the number is exactly halfway, we're going to round to the next, to the nearest even digit. So from 5, we're going to round up to 6. With 4, though, right, 43.45, it's rounded to 43.4. So our next even digit is 4 instead of 5. All right, so that's the way we do that. So what do you do if you have a calculation that involves a whole bunch of operations? Well, when we're doing the operations, we want to follow our order of operations. There's a little mnemonic here called PEMDAS that will help you remember the order of operations. So P for parentheses. So do the operations in parentheses first. Then if you have anything raised to an exponent, a power, you're going to do that next. For E is for exponent. M and D is for multiply and divide, so if you've got any multiplication and division, do that next. And finally, there's addition and subtraction, so PEMDAS. So at each step, each operation, you're going to try and keep track of the significant digits. So maybe you even write it above or whatever. And then we want to round to the correct significant digits at the end, following our rules for rounding. So for example, in um, this example, we've got a lot of operations to do. There's a subtraction here, and then we multiply, and then we're going to be dividing. So uh, let's work this one out, and we'll keep track of our significant digits along the way. Okay, so first we're going to do the thing that's inside the parentheses. So I type into my calculator 131.7 minus 119, and the answer that I get is 12.7.
7. So we want to keep track of the significant figures. So how many significant figures does this number have? Well, it looks like I just wrote down 3, right? That's what I got from my calculator. But remember, for subtraction, what do we do? We keep the smallest number of decimal places. So how many decimal places are in this number? 1. How many decimal places are in this number? 0. So technically, this number right here, we should round to 2 significant figures. So keeping track of that. So we've got 12.7. All right, so that's the bit that we did in parentheses, and now we're going to have uh, this bit right here. We have to multiply by 1.05, and then we're also dividing by 0.5. So it doesn't matter which order we do the multiplication and division, so I'm going to take the 12.7, and I'm going to multiply it first by, so I'm going to go times 1.05, hit the equals key, enter key, so I get that, and then I'm going to hit the division key and divide by 0.5. And so then I get as my final answer, with all of the digits still in my calculator, uh, 26.67. All right, so now we're ready to round the correct number of significant figures. So since we've done this multiplication and division step, right, I'm going to round to the smallest number of significant figures. So this number right here has 1, 2, 3 significant figures. This number in the denominator has 1, 2, 3. These zeros are significant since we reported them here. So those have three significant figures, but this number that we got as the result from the parentheses, remember we kept track that it has two significant figures. So two significant figures is my smallest number. So I'm going to round this to two significant digits, and so that means I'm going to be rounding it to the ones place. And since this digit right here is bigger than 5, so 67 is bigger than 5, the 6, and then the stuff that comes after it, I'm going to be rounding this up. So the correct number of significant figures to report this number, this would be 27. All right, and what we hope is that this is correctly reflecting the fact that we have some uncertainty in this last digit, right? So because up here in this number we have some uncertainty in the ones place, you know, plus or minus 1 in this uh, 9, it could be... 120 it could be 118, right, because of uncertainty. And so we don't want to report it to as many significant figures, assuming that we know how certain the tenths place is, because the uncertainty in this digit is much bigger than the tenths place, right? So we have a bigger uncertainty there. And so that's why we have to keep track of the significant figures at each step. Error, then, I told you before, is being different from what the true answer is. And there are different ways that you can, and we call that an error, and um, there are different kinds of errors, though. Two classes, one we call random errors, and one we call systematic errors. But before we start talking about those, let's talk a little bit about these two words that people oftentimes confuse. And as a good scientist, you need to stop confusing them. Uh, but it's tricky. You'll hear uh, even good scientists that you know kind of confuse these terms a little bit. So accuracy means closeness to the true value. Another way of thinking about it, it's correctness. In some fields, they talk about the term validity, so a measurement's validity. So how do you know the procedure is valid? Okay. So that's all about accuracy. So how close are you to the true value, assuming that what you're trying to measure really does have a certain length, a certain temperature, or whatever, and that there's some value that could be associated with that, and it has a particular value that you're trying to measure. So it's about the correctness. Precision has to do with the reproducibility of the measurement. So if you do the measurement over and over and over again, and it's the same system under the same conditions, you should be getting the same number, right? But you probably won't. So the reasons for that we'll talk about in a minute, but that has to do with precision. So how reproducible, how closely spaced together are your measurements? Another way of thinking about it is um, because reproducibility causes fluctuation in some digit, right? How many digits can you reliably report? So how many digits are in your measurement? So higher precision measurements will have more digits that you report that are significant, okay? So this is related to the term reliability, which you will sometimes hear in science. So how reliable is your measurement? So reliability is related to precision. Validity is related to accuracy. So errors then, um, limit the accuracy and the precision of measurements. Just to kind of clarify the difference between accuracy and precision, this is a common example that's used. So imagine that you're shooting at a target. So in this analogy, the target represents the true value. So if you're on target, 
on average, then your um, accuracy is good. So in this first example, all the shots are right here in the center of the target, tightly close, uh, clustered close together. So this is both accurate because we're hitting the center of the target and precise because there's not much scatter. In this case, um, all our points are still, all our shots are really close together but um, we're not hitting the middle of the target. So in this case, we're not accurate, but we're still precise, so our, we're still pretty reproducible. Unfortunately, we're just not getting the, um, the target. In this case, it looks like we're not getting the target, but on average, we are, right? If you were to average these four points, where on average on the target are you hitting? Well, pretty close to the middle, right? So on average, we're still hitting that target. So we could say that we're accurate, but there's a lot of scatter in these shots, and so we're not very precise. You know, again, that's a judgment call in this picture, but you get the idea. And in this case, then we would be not accurate and not precise, because on average we're not hitting the center of the target, and our shots are all scattered. All right? So there's a little bit of a picture that will help you think about the difference between accuracy and precision. So there are different kinds of things, right? Accuracy is about correctness, closeness to the true value. Precision is about reproducibility. Or you can think of it in terms of the number of digits that you get when you measure something. So there are two types of errors. So again, an error is something that makes your measurement different from the true value. So the first of those errors is called random error. A synonym for that that you'll sometimes hear, it's called indeterminate error. And random error affects the precision of a result, the reproducibility. Where does it come from? Well, it arises from a whole bunch of uncontrolled, which means that, and in principle, uncontrollable, so it's difficult to control those, get rid of them, right? Um, maybe we could minimize them. But they come from uncontrolled variables in the measurements, so things that are difficult to control, things like temperature fluctuations, building vibrations, air currents, static electric fields, phase of the moon, you know, any of these things that might be going on that could possibly affect a measurement, little tiny fluctuations. We have one instrument instrument in our department that is effective, it's sensitive enough, it uses a big magnet, and it's sensitive enough to detect when the elevator in the building is going up and down, so that causes some problems. Uh, the other thing about random error is that we talk about errors being positive or negative. So a positive error is greater than the true value, a negative error is less than the true value. So a random error then has an equal chance, it's random, of being higher than the true value, positive, or lower than the true value, negative. So sometimes, if you measure it a whole bunch of times, sometimes the random error will make it positive, sometimes the random error will make it negative. So you'll have a positive error or a negative error. So it has an equal chance of being one of those. So random error is always present in every measurement. It might be very small. We can't correct for it, so there's no way to kind of mathematically correct for it. We just have to deal with it. We might be able to redesign our experiment to minimize some of those random errors if we think we know what's causing them, but we can't get rid of them altogether. So we can't make them go to zero. We can just make them smaller. So an example might be reading a linear scale like we've already done. So if we're trying to read the percent transmittance here, again, we're pretty sure that it is greater than 58%, but you know, is it 58.2 or 58.3 or 58.1? It's not quite clear. That's a judgment call. And because different humans are going to judge that line placement a little bit differently, we get random variation. So there's probably a true value of that percent transmittance, but because of our estimation, sometimes we're going to be high, sometimes we're going to be low. Okay, so that's random error. So other kind of random errors like I talked about temperature fluctuations, pressure fluctuations, building vibrations, static electric fields, pH changes, you know, if you're trying to measure the temperature of an object, does it matter where your thermometer bulb is placed or where your thermometer uh, probe is placed? All of those kind of things lead to random errors. Also, in lab, right, we were trying to put a meniscus on top of a little line. So sometimes you might be a little high, sometimes you might be a little low. Sometimes your hand might shake and there might be a little drop that drips out of the tip of your pipette, leaving behind an air bubble. So when you go to transfer that, you're not transferring all of the liquid, you're transferring a little bit of air. So there's a random fluctuation that has caused a little bit of random error. So you would be delivering less volume than you think you are. So now let's talk about systematic errors. So systematic errors are called determinant errors because in principle we can figure out what they are and correct for them, although we may not have time or uh, ability to do that. So systematic errors affect the accuracy, the nearness to the true value. So these impact the validity.
Where do they come from? Well, in analytical chemistry, they might arise from a flaw in the equipment. Uh, they might arise from like a miscalibration. So you thought you calibrated it, but you did something wrong. And so you think you know what the volume of that pipette is, but you made a mistake in the procedure right? It may come from an interference in the matrix. So maybe you think you're measuring the chloride content, but the method that you're using also detects bromide, and there's a little bit of bromide in that sample matrix. And so your measurement for the chloride content will be a little bit high. That will be a positive systematic error. It could be that there's a flaw in the design or the execution of the experiment. So this is what some people, the execution and maybe even the design, this is what some people call human error, right? So never list human error as a source of error, right? There may be systematic error, but it's error because of design or because you're not using the pipette like it's supposed to be, right? Sure, there's going to be the meniscus a little high, a little bit low. That's random error. That's always going to be there, right? That's fluctuations. But you shouldn't have human error as systematic error. You should be able to figure that out. So an example of a systematic error, let's imagine that we have an incorrectly standardized pH meter. So we standardize pH meters by putting the probe into a buffer whose pH we know. And then we tell the instrument, hey, that's supposed to be pH 7. So suppose the buffer we used to standardize the meter at pH 7 is really at 7.08. But we tell the meter, hey, no, that's really 7. So that means all of our future pH readings are going to be 0.08 pH units too low. So a pH reading of 5.60 is actually 5.68. That would be the true value. So we've got what we call a negative systematic error. It is lower than the true value. And that was caused from a miscalibration it's because we used a buffer that wasn't what we thought it was. So with diligence and with experimentation, systematic error can always be discovered and eliminated. So we can figure out what it is. We can find ways to correct for it. But there will still be random error on top of that that is always present in addition to the systematic error. So there's always random error plus systematic error. We hope we can eliminate the systematic error. Sometimes you can do things to reduce the size of the random error, but you can't make it go away altogether. So again, we try to eliminate systematic errors. So how do we go about detecting systematic error? Well, there are a few ways that you could do it. First, you can analyze a known sample. So that's a sample that has a known amount of analyte in it. Um, we call those materials certified reference materials, CRMs. And um, they've been analyzed uh, through a variety of methods. And so we know for that particular sample what the analyte concentration is. So you can test that sample and see if you get the known answer. A second thing that you can do is run a blank, blank sample. So a blank sample is a sample that contains no analyte, but hopefully reproduces everything else in the matrix. So if you happen to get a non-zero result, so it should still show that there's a zero amount of analyte, then uh, your method is responding to something else. Another thing you could do is try to use different analytical methods that analyze for that same analyte and see if you get the same result. Another thing that we can do is something called a round robin analysis, and that's where uh, different analysts analyze the same sample, or perhaps even different labs. So they'll send the same sample around to different labs, kind of goes around in a circle, and everybody analyzes the same result. And let's say that everybody gets, you know, kind of a different result than you. Well, that means that, well, sadly, you are the problem. And so we need to figure out what's going on with your particular handling or your particular set of reagents or, or whatever. So in all of these cases, any disagreement beyond what we estimate as the random error is due to systematic error. So it's true that some of these may not produce the same results. So you may get a non-zero result for a blank sample, but maybe it's within random error of what zero is. In the next chapter, we're going to learn about how to mathematically test to see if you uh, disagree with uh, one of these other results, and if it's within random error or not within random error. So finally, how do we get uncertainties from random errors? So random errors produce variation from trial to trial, so they affect our reproducibility, they affect our precision. So um, that's going to limit our uncertainty, right? So that, that's gonna increase our uncertainty if it's a large random error. So how can we measure our uncertainty due to random errors. So we hope that we found and eliminated all systematic errors, so random error will be the only thing left. Well, sometimes we can estimate it by uh, when we're making measurements associated with, say, the length of an object 
or the temperature of a solution, or we're reading a particular scale. So sometimes we can estimate it when we're using a scale. So you just kind of guess, well, how far off could I be in either direction? So if we go back to that gray box, you know, maybe you could be off by as much as two hundredths of a centimeter. It seems unlikely that you would be off by three hundredths or four hundredths of a centimeter. No, it seems like that we're pretty sure that that gray box was a little bit past halfway, right? So we know that with some certainty. So we're just kind of estimating what that error bar, that plus or minus is. Now for replicates, where you've measured the same thing multiple times, you should get the same answer. The reason you're not is due to random error. So if we can figure out how much those repeated measures vary, then we can get an estimate of the size of the random error. And so typically that's done by calculating a statistical quantity called the standard deviation. We'll learn how to do that in the next chapter. Also one called the standard deviation of the mean, which is sometimes called standard error. And we'll learn about all of these in chapter four. And finally, there's this uh, powerful one called the confidence interval. All right, so remember then that the last reported digit will always be the first digit that is uncertain. And that's the first digit that's gonna vary due to random errors, because we're assuming that we've detected and eliminated all systematic errors. All right, so there's a little bit about error and um, why we do significant figures and uncertainties. So for the rest of chapter three, we're gonna go and talk about how do you, if you know what some of these uncertainties are and you're doing calculations with those numbers to calculate a new value, how do you figure out what the size of the uncertainty is in that new calculated value? So we're going to learn how to do that in the rest of chapter three.